Well, thank you, Garanka. It's a, a real honor and a pleasure to be here um, at the Ethnographic Museum and um, with all the um, participants online as well. Um, so uh, I would just like to uh, explain a little bit about the uh, report that we did and the research that we did um, under Garanka's leadership, in fact. Um, so it was a project that involved uh, partners uh, ICOM C, uh, ICOM Zambia, um, ICOM India, as uh, Garanka mentioned, ICOM Bosnia Herzegovina, um, ICOM Croatia, um, and the Kolkata Center for Creativity, um, with a partner who we have in Argentina, um, to, who uh, called Fundacion Tipa, who did a lot of the sort of technical gathering together of museum leaders. So um, between March 2020 and June 2021. Um, a project team of Intercom members um, uh, carried out a, a really comprehensive survey of museum directors uh, all over the world. Um, phase one was um, a, a survey uh, and phase two we published a report here you can see um, uh, museum leadership taking the pulse. Um, which is freely available on Intercom's website um, in French, Spanish, Arabic, uh, and English. And we're just concluding phase three now, and, and Garank has it in all the languages there. We're just concluding phase three now, which is to organize regional directors forums um, to bring together museum directors in Latin America, museum directors in Africa, um, Southeast Europe, and South Asia. And the Southeast Europe Directors Forum was uh, yesterday. Many of you um, took part and we had active discussions. Um, and that's what was the real key for this research is these discussions amongst museum leaders to see how museum leadership differs, how the challenges differ around the world. Um, so in Latin America, the discussion was around political interference. So it's happening in other parts of the world, too, that we can learn from. Um, and, and they came up with some solutions how to deal with it. In Africa, the themes were decolonization, uh, which you can imagine makes sense for that region of the world, and government relations. So again, they have these difficulties with their government stakeholders. Uh, Southeast Europe directors um, chose to focus on strategic communications um, uh, as well as empowering staff and um, stakeholder management. So again, the same leadership issues are coming up. Um, and each director's forum was followed by peer-to-peer -peer mentoring um, to help build networks of museum directors who can support each other to build a collective voice. Um, so um, the research gave us a picture of the issues that museum leaders are facing. But the real question is, what power do they have to lead their institutions? What flexibility do they have um, in their financial sustainability? And what skills do they need to succeed as leaders? Um, the first phase um, of, of the data collection was uh, in March 2020, and that was to um, we had interviews with museum leaders to establish some of the research questions. The research went out to over 900 um, museum leaders, um, and then we car carried out in-depth interviews with a selection of them to provide context for the data. Um, and the surveys were issued in Arabic, Chinese, Russian, as well as the three ICOM languages, French, Spanish, and English. So you can see here the predominance of um, the responses came from Europe. Um, that's partly because ICOM's membership is predominantly European, um, so nearly 50% of the respondents were from Europe. And the gender split was 60% female and 40% male. So um, looking regionally about what we learned, um, the common concerns, as Garanga has mentioned, was lack of funding. Um, so that is, that's global. Um, uh, but it's the differences between the regions which are actually interesting. So in Europe, the key concern, apart from lack of finances, um, was competition between cultural institutions. Um, so this could be because a large number of European museums are government funded. 
um, and they don't have independent revenue streams. So this reliance on government uh, creates increased competition, um, particularly in difficult economic times. European museums also reported lack of tools to motivate staff. And North American and Asian museum directors were concerned about lack of leadership development, um, whereas the Middle East uh, museum directors were affected by lack of clear co governmental vision. And that could be because a lot of museums being built in that area are currently built as part of a sort of nation building exercise without much real interest or understanding of what a museum actually is with regards to social development. So uh, then we looked at um, the sort of crises that museum leaders have been dealing with, bearing in mind that this survey went out in the middle of the pandemic. So well, hey, there we go, pandemic is a big issue. Um, so naturally that was um, that that featured very large. Um, but um, it's actually uh, under other that the real interest uh, lies. Um, uh, political interference came up a lot um, and revealing increased politicizing of museum appointments as well as interference in museums from from a, a sort of, of a political nature. The other was social unrest as an issue. Um, and this includes um, museums being targeted by protest groups and also targeted online with disinformation on social media aimed at harming the museum's reputation. So there are some pretty serious challenges that we are all um, looking at. So let's look at what skills museum leaders need in order to face some of these challenges. So. Um, they felt top of top of the list. Um, it's unfortunately not very visible there, but it's all in the report. Um, top of the list was setting the mission and um, vision was the most important skill that museum leaders felt um, uh, would would help them. Um, and they also felt that they needed to be adaptable and open to change. Um, and what interested me was that advocacy. So really advocating for your museum, promoting your museum, defending it, um, scored very low, um, uh, but they felt that the capacity to manage stakeholders was important. Well, that requires advocacy. So there's an interesting discrepancy there. Um, and actually, we surveyed the museum directors of ICOM-C before the directors forum yesterday to see what the issues were um, and stakeholder management was one of the big issues so there's an interest in that um, interestingly sourcing additional funds was not seen as important but perhaps that's because the majority of the museums uh, who responded were government funded so sourcing additional funds is not within the remit of a director um, uh, and I found it very interesting um, that in the research, the, there was an impulse that, that the museum directors had to attribute their problems to lack of funding. Um, and lack of funding is an existential issue. Museums are closing around the world and suffering from an economic downturn. Um, but, and it's not a trivial issue either. Um, but it's not the only, only solution. Funding isn't the only solution. Um, to the critical state that our museums find themselves in. Um, so what um, we ask questions um, aiming at establishing the level of autonomy that museum leaders have. Um, so um, control around staffing and changing the organizational structure and authority to decide how budget is used um, and influence over the public program and, and freedom to implement change in the museum. Those were the, those were the sort of questions. With regards to staffing levels, 50% of respondents had complete authority to choose their staff, appoint staff, and, but 13% had no authority at all. Um, and 16% could appoint staff, but with board or government approval. Um, there seemed to be less liberty to change the organizational structure so only 14% of respondents were able to change the structure of their museum. And 62% of them, 62 required um, board or government approval to do that. With regards to exhibition programming, there was much more liberty. 
with 69% having complete control over their exhibitions and public programs. So how easy is it to implement change? Um, this graph um, illustrates the difficulties that museum directors have in implementing change. The pink, um, which is the, the column on the most right of each of those groups, represents impossible. And thankfully, there aren't, aren't many museums who are faced with the impossibility of leading change. Um, and the areas of each of these um, graphs are organizational restructuring, which is on the left hand most one, which you can see is very low. Um, digitization, collections decolonization, budgetary and financial changes, and implementing a str strategic vision. So um, digitization and decolonization appear to be the easiest changes to implement for our museum directors and budgetary and financial changes, staff restructuring and human resources were much more difficult. But these are the resources that museum leaders need to lead their museums and generate the positive in impact in society that governments want. Yet these are the areas where it's most difficult for museum directors to exert influence. So what factors are um, limiting the ability to um, implement change? Um, the top three were funding, naturally, bureaucracy, and curiously, a lack of clear vision for change. 12% of museum directors said there was a lack of clear vision for change. And I find that interesting because in a way, it's the museum leader who sets that vision. So I'm not quite sure what, what was happening there. Um, so the factors that help museum directors to, 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 ch to change were um, top of the list, um, nearly 30%, a clear vision um, and committed staff. So that relationship between leader and followers is very important and support of the board was uh, also um, one of the top factors. Um, interestingly, sufficient funding and government support were not deemed to be influential in enabling museums to um, implement change. So looking at key professional development interventions that have helped museum directors in their lead develop leadership skills, the clear majority feel that their academic reputation is the most important professional qualification that helped them to develop confidence to become a leader, followed by membership of professional networks. So everything that is happening here through ICOMC and local networks and country networks is of great support. Um, uh, so what is interesting here is that sort of museum leadership courses and muse museum studies courses score quite low, um, which is which is an interesting um, museum directors are, are finding more um, development from networks than they are from formal ways of developing um, leadership skills. Um, and the, the threat of financial instability was very present in a lot of the survey results, as I've mentioned. But developing financial and business skills doesn't score highly as a need for museum, as, as, as a requirement for museum leaders. Um, so these are the findings of our research. And I'll just finish with a few words about leadership and influence, having, having seen the results of, of these um, research. So um, two research studies were done. This is completely separate, not in the museum sector. Um, uh, uh, but, um, but what's interesting about them is that they showed that 65% um, of key leadership traits um, are, can be learned. Um, so it's not just the innate ones like charisma um, or humility or courage, but um, key leadership qualities can be learned and improved. Um, over time, such as effective communications, goal setting, strategic thinking. And the keys that unlock that potential are feeling responsible for your own development as a leader, curiosity about yourself, and a willingness to change. Um, so let's look at the qualities that effective leaders possess. 
Um, they are self-aware and prioritize personal development. They focus on developing others alongside that. They encourage strategic thinking, innovation and action. Um, they are open, transparent and authentic. And they adapt their communications and leadership style according to the context. So we can use what we have to exert influence over our situation in spite of the external situation, be that economic, social, political. By being responsible for our own leadership development and using our skills to develop ourselves and enable others, we can inspire our staff, we can inspire communities, and through that we can inspire our stakeholders. It takes time. Um, and, but even if we are constrained by political influence, we can use our skills to influence within our sphere of influence. And by doing that, we can ha then have influence outside that sphere. So we can influence up to government, we can influence sideways, other museums, the, the general cultural sector, and we can influence our staff and their teams. We can develop influencer networks and mutual support networks, and I think we have some good examples of that, particularly here. And we can develop common messages for policymakers, which have impact because they're said with one voice and by more than one cultural leader. We can support each other with sharing ideas and successes. And we can develop through mentoring and an interest in our own and others' development, as we will hear later from Vizhna. We can influence what is in our control and use that to make changes that are outside our control. I remember I was struck yesterday by Gaspar mentioning um, a key objective of their strategic plan is to gain visibility and then they will be heard. So they're not trying to do it all at once. Um, they won't be able to change employment law or tax law, which were some of the things we talked about yesterday, but by being more visible, they will have more influence and it takes leadership to have the vision and motivate your staff to be part of making that change. So hopefully we can do this by being inspiring leaders within our museum community. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lizzie, for this, uh, how to say, uh, comprehensive and brief survey uh, <laughs> what uh, we have been uh, <clears throat> doing as a research. Uh, I would like now to pinpoint some of the uh, points uh, you have uh, uh, mentioned uh, and uh, we can discuss them. For example, uh, in every strategy we have mission and vision mission and vision uh, as a, a, a key inspiring uh, motivating uh, uh, sentences and messages that museums uh, give out but uh, we had before going to prague's conference we had here in our museum uh, the meeting with the colleague from npr uh, who uh, actually did a research on mission and vision and asked the question, how many of you know the vision and mission of, of your museum? You know, with my staff here, of course, nobody. Why? Hmm? Any idea? Hmm? We have one, yes, but, and they have, uh, we have made it together you know with uh, with uh, circling the document etc but nobody can repeat it hmm? uh, uh, Sanin, you wanted to say I mean, it's, it's, I, I, it's a common thing probably well, it is a common thing oh, i'm sorry and i love this opportunity to to partake in in this very interesting and, and insightful conference so uh, let me start by thanking lizzie for this this wonderful uh, exposition and, and in answering this it's I think that perhaps that's just my view and uh, even though at the archaeological museum we haven't uh, gone through the same exercise I suspect that the results might be pretty much the same 
and it goes to 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 underscore the the effective use that is presently or on a daily basis thought of mission and vision statements it's more or less something that you know exists somewhere there but it's not you know it's not a beacon that is always emblazoned on something that we look upon and follow it as a you know the point where we want to go because ultimately everything that you do at your institution every activity project operations and so on ought to be aligned with that so it's also a reminder to the museum leaders that it's like Liz has said it's on us we are not just passive spectators of you know, the things that just flow day in day out it's on us to lead everyone you know sometimes to 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 to, well, to use all the tools that we have on our disposal to to attract the attention of others and we need to do it repeatedly because if you do something that is in terms of in terms of operational hierarchy you know the third or fourth level like you know small projects or or, or you know meetings and so if it's not aligned with the vision strategic goals the chances are you might be going in the different direction which is something that we just can't allow to do so it's something it's a reminder that we need to to explain the importance of that these are not just words this is not something that you you know like strategic plans that you make create and then put it in a drawer and then lock the drawer it's something that should be there in our minds and you know in front of our eyes so that we can follow that Definitely. And also, we have heard yesterday, I think it was you, Markita, who mentioned uh, that uh, some documents are already are made, you know, and uh, branding, communication with an EU project. Mm -hmm. But then how to put them in practice? What's the use of these documents? Well, um, from my point of view and my experience, these documents uh, that were made uh, as part as EU project were not as good as we expected. So uh, they were done because they had to be done uh, as part of the project and uh, uh, not to be uh, punished by those the, that are financing us. We participated in it, but uh, not, uh, uh, not as much as we should. Uh, because we didn't have time and so you know it's a, a running 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 to get the term and so so it's not done from the inside of the museum and perhaps uh, uh, it's a, uh, also the question with mission and vision uh, nevertheless some uh, uh, they may be done uh, together uh, but uh, they may be perceived by the staff that uh, uh, that uh, task was imposed by a leader and, uh, and they were expected uh, a leader to formulate it and then we accept it well without discussion because they are not interested in or they don't uh, see it as much as important as it should be and so. And maybe, um, for example, I think our mission and vision is, um, is formulated in the not uh, uh, everyday language. In the, the language is not simple and it's not formulated in the way uh, that we remember it easily. And I think that's also a reason why we don't as much as I, I don't, I can't repeat it as it's written yeah. because it's, uh, formulated in written as written statement not common everyday language so it might be also the reason neither i can repeat it because it's half of the page yeah. you know and for example our our npr uh, colleague actually uh, said well it will be better you know if it's a short like inviting inspiring message in one sentence that can move people you know uh, 
uh, like, for example, branding companies are doing. But of course, staff have other opinions too. Okay, yes, please. Just, uh, this is an easy, <laughs> yeah. although important discussion, of course. I was just going to basically say what you said. It's mission and vision statements. Uh, the way they are mostly done, it's the box ticking mentality. Oh, we need a mission and vision. Okay, let's have one, mm -hmm. which nobody can repeat, which can in, cannot inspire anybody. Keep them short and sweet. Let it be an inspiration. I think I could I could quote a few visions, you know, or mission statements. I'm not going to do it because I might this this may backfire. But you know, think of you know Microsoft, Nike, and things like that. Of course, museum. I'm not comparing this to multi multinational big big corporations, but it is that it needs to have a power and strength to move and it also has to be an umbrella you know, in terms of everything else has to has to somehow be aligned with that but i'm repeating myself i think for the alignment to work it has to be relevant it has to be relevant to everybody in the museum and as you've already said short so other non-profits like so if you take oxfam for example their vision statement is end poverty now that's never going to happen but they are striving towards it it's where it's the direction it's not the result um, and that's what gets people motivated is i know where i'm going i might not get there but i know where i'm going so it's aligning you know it's short it's aligning people and it needs to be relevant to them uh, so that they feel that they can it's it belongs to them for yours it came from outside or it felt as if it came from outside so it's never going to work uh, there is also for example this need uh, that for example the mission describes what the museum do you know and then when you enter in that field somehow people feel insecure not mentioning everything because sooner or later you will be asked whether your collection policy is in line with the mission uh, you know uh, whether you have put everything uh, inside and then you can submit the document as a support for your financing uh, for acquisitions etc so that's why let's be sure and have everything what we do inside and of course then it cannot be inspirational well yes. i'm with you on that and then entirely it's it's actually the the, the trade-offs that you're making and uh, the more people or the more areas you want to satisfy the lesser will the vision or mission have the real meaning and, and, and power of inspiration. So I agree entirely. Uh, actually, I, was, I grabbed for the mic because I wanted to, to, to just add to what Lizzie was saying and also Marquita said, the strategy, strategic plans, so if you commission them from somebody else, it's never going to work. It just cannot work. It has to come from within. And then if you're not skilled, in, in creating such documents, because it's, it's an art in itself, you may have somebody help you with that. But if it's just, okay, we'll give you that many you know, thousands of something, you know, euro, and please, you have a month or two to send us our strategy. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's just useless. Well, sure. Uh, Yurita, you would agree? <laughs> Well, I have just the same example because I'm only director for two years. I inherited some things from from the past, and that's what we have: the strategic plan, who made some company for for us, and we I see that's not working because a lot of change, and uh, we didn't have so much inside information or the people involved who are working exactly in the in the museum so uh totally wrong way to 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 do it yeah. i think the well, other the other missing you. uh element is is really understanding who you're for what you're for what are your values and that having really clear values 
has uh, the instances where political interference has come in but if you have values which demonstrate your integrity it is very difficult even for politicians to start to mess with that they do and they can but um aligning your your value uh, in a way starting with your values to create your vision and then the mission is how you do it is it, that's the sort of triangle that, that i think can work yes we would like to also include our people online please dear participants <laughs> so you all have the possibility to be uh, 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 to get involved please raise your hands if you want to say something vishnya is here also with the with the hand up uh, so if you uh, can uh, say something vishnya please Yes, because I'm coming usually from this other end where sometimes museum directors, but sometimes local administration in different cities comes and asks me and my colleagues, can you do a strategic plan for our museum? And for a long time, I think I think it was only once that I accepted to do that sort of thing. Every other time it was actually agreeing how we can make an educational program for the museum stuff how it can last for a year so that every single step in strategic plan is being rethought by the museum staff itself themselves so that then there's really both this ownership but that also this opportunity that the strategic planning brings is used by everyone and i think it brings so many valuable things one is really reassessing your position in society reassessing what are what are you doing at the moment in every single aspect of museum work? What are the trends and tendencies? How you can lean on some of them? Whom you can partner with? Who you don't want to partner it with or who you don't want to become? Reassessing kind of relationship with audiences, with the board, with the funders and so many other things. And then as a consequence of that comes the vision and is followed by strategic priorities and so on. And I think in our regional context, we have such an aversion of strategic planning because it's done by someone outside. It's usually done by someone who is not even an expert in the museum field, who never worked in a museum. And then it's also done just to tick the box that the administration asks the local municipality or the Ministry of Culture. And I think because of all of those reasons, strategic plans are hated and not taken seriously. But with those museums that I have been working with, where they were the ones really reappropriating their own strategic planning process, it meant so much for the future work. And even though the strategic plan is maybe not implemented in its totality, things change. For example, in some of them, COVID came and totally reshuffled some of the priorities, but then some of the directions were so clear, then, then it was clear to communicate them with the kind of governing board, with the local municipality. And I find those museums who have strategic plan and who stick to that, that strategic plan is actually a mechanism to kind of balance the relationship with the decision makers and with the with the board, with people who come and say, let's make an exhibition ad hoc there in your museum. And then you could say, no, but actually we have this plan. This is what keeps us together. But yeah, if there's any advice from this other side, don't ask consultants to do it, especially don't ask consultants who are coming from the business background, but actually who are at the museum field, but use consultants to kind of help you and guide you through the process of strategic planning which you are going to kind of do yourself and appropriate it with everyone else in the museum yes thank you Vishnya. anyone else would like to uh, add something on mission and vision uh, what do you feel for example do, do you find it easy to make a vision and uh, a, a mission for your museum or to set a course uh, how to do it for your staff. Okay, no responses so far. Uh, so uh, uh, let us uh, say that our conclusions uh, from August were so to have an inspiring w w sentence for the for the museum 
for somehow uh, uh, collecting all our endeavors in that message and also have a kind of backup uh, explanatory text what we are doing and why we are founded uh, for this could be a kind of a compromise that could probably uh, uh, make everyone happy in the institution. Another, um, another thing we were discussing and uh, uh, we really uh, found important also yesterday and today is the museum reputation, uh, museum visibility. So, uh, so this is something that uh, can be, uh, how to say, uh, a firm uh, advantage in our hands if we are visible, if we are recognized in, in the broader society by media, and then probably uh, the authorities uh, will respect that. Uh, so how to how to build the reputation? Uh, we have uh, institutions that obviously inherited uh, some kind of reputation from the past because of the richness of collections, uh, position in, in the law, in the legislative. Uh, for example, um, really uh, nice buildings, uh, connection with tourism, etc. So, what do you what do you think brings uh, most attention to museums? Yes, Daniela. Hello. Thank you for uh, joining. Uh, to this forum, uh, I'm a director of Museum in Tivas from October, and uh, here uh, we have another one problem, but uh, when we remove uh, in uh, January a uh, theatral scene from our atrium, from our yard, uh, from the summer medieval house of family, well-known family Bucha, um, many people from Montenegro uh, start and uh, learn that Tivat uh, have a museum with own collections. And that is one a big uh, issue and problem and uh, uh, good thing at the end for us, good thing. People start to learn that we fight and defend our collections and the uh, cultural good, uh, good because it's uh, protected as a uh, cultural good, uh, good this, uh, cultural uh, uh, from, uh, medieval summer house from 15th century. This is a hard way how to start to make a reputation of the museum, but uh, I think uh, they know now that we are very serious in, in that. Yes, sometimes even uh, a negative, uh, uh, how to say, uh, uh, event yeah. uh, can actually uh, brought attention uh, to the museum and help it. Uh, hey, we are here. It is very uh, difficult and challenging. Uh, we saw yesterday also from Darko Komchan's lecture, uh, when you uh, are a museum in charge of very famous monuments. Uh, of course, there are advantages in earning a lot of income and uh, having really, really uh, unbelievable amount for the rest of us uh, uh, at your disposal. But on the other hand, there are a lot of interests around. Uh, it's not easy to manage. There are, for example, uh, requirements that you use it for theater performances, concerts, festivals, and all these events uh, require a lot of people, a lot of support. Uh, who is going to share costs and uh, uh, incomes, etc. So uh, this is this is not easy. But of course, it brings a lot of media attention uh, to your museum. On the other hand, and it's really not uh, possible to ignore such an institution. Uh, while, for example, for authorities, uh, when they deal with a small museum, 
uh, it's easy to forget they, they are the founder. Any experiences in that, uh, uh, in that sense? Many, many of us are actually in the protected monuments of culture. Uh, if I may just take a step back and uh, respond to, to your previous question and then to the comment that you've also made when it comes to building reputation. Uh, you mentioned that sometimes even negative publicity can you know, put you in the spotlight. And of course, it's nothing new. It's the old, it's the old uh, lima of, uh, of P.T. Barnum who said, "There's no such thing as bad publicity. It just, you know, it's your ability to 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 put something, you know, of a, of a layer of acceptance on it that works for you or not." Uh, we try to stay clear at the Archaeological Museum of. Of, of negative publicity and are more sort of focusing on, on building reputation or actually I should say of, of continuing uh, adding to the reputation that has already been created by the generation before us. Uh, we need to start by acknowledging that, that there are no two, no two museums are the same. So, based on, on, on the level, whether you're a museum with a national remit or a regional or a local or, or international, you position yourself in that respect and then you're also trying to respond to the audience or audiences that, that you have identified as your target group. Now, using the example of the Archaeological Museum in Zagreb, which is a national museum with a national remit, with a half a million uh, strong holdings, there are nearly half a million objects in our, in our uh, holdings, uh, many of which are of, uh, of uh, uh, highly important for the history or prehistory of Croatia or even some other country. So our audience is obviously national and international. And uh, the way we are building reputation is based on both something that is, let's call it given, which is the existing holdings, which we normally are our reg regular way of communi communicating that mm -hmm. is through permanent display. Then what you have are yearly annual programs or, or temporary exhibitions, but not only exhibitions, there are other means of communication that museums are employing through publications, through events that may be you know, larger or smaller. So what you do is you're trying to build a, a yearly cycle, something that is manageable or even several year long cycle in which you are addressing continually with messages that are of course sometimes tailor-made because you're trying to 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 attract or or to to uh, to talk to communicate to a specific audience or you're doing something that goes orbi at orbi and you are simply communicating the, what the museum is doing yes when and this is uh, this is for example what the colleague uh, from bosnia Ljubiša, i think uh, said yesterday that you have to arrange throughout the year uh, 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 programs that will uh, make the opportunity for you to, uh, you know, uh, promote your work. But also, let us uh, maybe tackle one another issue, and that is, uh, these events are uh, actually attracting authorities to come to visit your museum, a minister, uh, a minister and uh, mayor, uh, Markita would like to say something if you can. Um, from my point of view and experience uh, as museum director, when I applied for museum director, one of the uh, strategic uh, tasks was to raise visibility and, uh, um, and we succeeded through years. I think uh, not only through permanent display, which is an old building uh, and which uh, during time uh, was refurbished and uh, permanent display is quite old with some new uh, parts, but it's mostly um, a lot of programs, uh, a lot of programs throughout the year, uh, the whole year and years. Now, uh, a lot of communication with audience through different media and uh, 
social media or that uh, we are uh, uh, administrating and a lot of collaborations with different uh, uh, partners. So these are the science, scientific community, uh, cultural community, NGOs, different, different partners uh, which come to our museums and we uh, make programs uh, co uh, in collaboration or we invite them to have their programs in our museum. So I think uh, um, uh, what brought us visibility are programs and communication, regular communication, non one in a month or one in three months when we have some bigger program. It's almost everyday communication. And we uh, have well, this yes. uh, measured uh, through analysis of our media uh, presence, which we make every year uh, through um, analysis uh, by professionals uh, uh, of the media coverage we have. Yes, you are highly visited museum. That is also important. You've got a lot of all this 100,000 uh, when you or uh, you had even 200,000, I think, before COVID. Uh, so it's it, it's a huge number, you know. So you have to be recognized. But if you if you are uh, uh, you know if you if you have low visibility uh, visiting numbers then it is it is not so easy i would like to switch now on to another uh, aspect which uh, in our leadership survey uh, was how to say noticeable and that is the uh, this uh, still high confidence of museum directors who were interviewed in the survey that uh, on the top of their requirements to be good leaders is academic uh, background. So that being uh, an excellent art historian, archaeologist, technologist, historian, makes you qualified really the best uh, for uh, management issues. And then on the other hand, we noticed that what they need for the support uh, those business courses were really on the bottom of the priorities. So how could you explain that from your own perspective, for example? Alika. Uh, hello from me. Um, I think that uh, always when we do the survey and then we have, when we have to rank things, uh, sometimes even a lot, quite a lot, uh, quite a high rank of importance, uh, actually uh, um, takes this, the last place. I think this was also one of the cases uh, because in one way leading this type of institution, you have to trust also the accountants and you have to trust the people that you're working with. And actually, you know, this finance and things uh, sometimes have um, a lot to do with uh, um, legislation and other things. And you cannot, you cannot not know everything. You have to trust this person that is making all the things behind this financial uh, and budgetary reports and everything. So from, I think, this point of view that I can grasp through the conversation with my colleagues in Slovenia and even in ICOMC, it's not that it is not important. It is very important to understand how the budget works, how actually we can improve also in this level, but connected to all other things that we have to do Maybe this is not the first priority. Um, I don't know what would happen if we had an economist for the director in the museum. I'm not sure. In our countries, uh, um, I think that only a few, few directors come from other professions. Uh, for example, in Slovenia, we have only one that is actually the lawyer. Uh, and all the others, uh, we are from different type of, uh, how do you say, uh, classical, professions uh, and in Academia. one hand yeah in one hand we also always um, uh, say this is the most important because the counting can be done um, by expert for that we try to get um, assistance 
to be two-headed in one way, leadership, to have um, knowledge from this also very important field of our work. Thank you. Yes, Anya, please. Okay. My apologies for grabbing the mic so often, but I need to leave, so okay. I will make just one last yeah. statement, although I'm, I'll be very sad for leaving this. Uh, I'll be blunt here. In my opinion, I don't think that if you're really good in academia, if you're a best archaeologist or something, <coughs> that that qualifies you as a perfect museum director. My opinion is that uh, these are, you actually have to be a cultural manager. This is the directorial position. And uh, if you're coming and if you rose through the ranks of academia and that qualified you for the director, my, my opinion is that y your vision and your activities and your you know, leadership is actually impaired by many things that make you a good, uh, uh, let's call it archaeologist in this case, but ethnographist, etc. So, uh, I believe that uh, it's a question of education in Croatia, and I can speak for us. We don't have such a well-developed uh, system for raising cultural managers. Uh, most of us who are directors now, we're not really enrolled in any such programs, at least not in Croatia, and then uh, gain those skills so that we became directors. We mostly became directors because we were in that, in that field and, and then again rose through the ranks. But uh, what I would suggest is that, yes, let's, be, let's have cultural managers who are familiar with the topic, main topic of, of uh, or the profession that, that you're, you're managing the institution for, and then also uh, rely on the, the staff, on the, on the uh, expert staff. Because uh, your authorities as the manager should not only rely on that profession, but mostly on your managerial skills, because it's much more than academia. That's <laughs> Darko, yes, please. Yeah. Well, my reading, in a way, maybe I'm misinterpreting this, but I think that the, the, the message of the, of the survey is saying uh, it's, uh, it's more, well, it's, let, let's be uh, uh, careful about who is the manager, in a sense of uh, saying like, and that's my opinion too, to be honest, it's more easy to, uh, for an uh, expert coming from the field to learn about managerial skills than the master of business, somebody who is having the master of business administration to, be, to understand fully museum job. And I, from my point of view, I think the survey do show that, not 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 uh, putting on a on on a bottom the the uh, uh, managerial skills, but somehow actually that that's reflection of the of the way in a sense of if somebody who is just doing the you know skill who have skills with a uh, Excel uh, 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 tables and and, and 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 economics could do anything. Not true. That's not true. Thank you, Darko. Uh, we have two uh, people online. Lubisha, please. And then uh, Terra Museum. Hello, everyone. Uh, greetings from Tuzla. Uh, well, I, I would have to completely agree with the colleagues. Uh, academia is, in my opinion, totally irrelevant. Uh, I'm stating this from my own personal experiences since I'm not an historian, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm a producer. And I finished the Ac Academy of Dramatic Arts. And while doing so, we had uh, cultural management, introducing cultural policies, how to manage cultural institutions, fundraising, marketing. That's also very important, marketing. Marketing is one of the most uh, relevant segments of any uh, institution. And in uh, regard of uh, the stated here, I agree that uh, academia uh, is one thing. And yes, I, I, I really like that I have my historians, my archaeologists, whom I can go to and ask them some specific uh, questions about their area. But in terms of management, uh, that's a whole new study. 
management, especially regarding the cultural field. Uh, management is not only about making a budget, it's about understanding the budget, it's about under projecting a plan, uh, through a one year plan, three year plan, five to 10 year plans. So yeah, uh, in my opinion, we need more cultural management managers and we need them on directorial positions. Thank you. Well, I will allow another question from Tara and a short one from uh, Danira, a comment, and then we'll switch to the creative mentorship uh, uh, workshop. Uh, yes, thank you, Goranka. Hi, all. Uh, this is the Museum Terror from Kikinda. Uh, again, we can introduce uh, my, uh, ourselves. So uh, I would actually will totally agree with Ljubisha and the previous uh, uh, correspondent who talked about cultural manager because uh, I was trained of probably the Vishnya can confirm than the all, the all others. Uh, I think uh, the uh, inheritance of importance of academia is inheritance of the previous system where the institutional institutional logic was important. So actually, uh, the institutions were found in one system, and uh, they do not actually question themselves through the through the socio-economical change uh, change they're uh, they're passing through. So actually. Uh, the institutions and museums are uh, found in, in that system that these managerial skills are transferred to the other system, to the state. And now actually it's completely, completely different. So I, I think that I would agree with Ljubiša and the previous uh, because the cultural managing is, is important because um, actually uh, it does have, it's it's not only the budget as Ljubiša says, it's, it's, the, 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 it's the strategic planning, the planning of programs, and uh, that it does involve uh, the knowledge uh, of uh, of museum um, of museum business uh, in 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 general. Actually, there is a danger if, if that some position is one is it's a manager which is not actually the cultural manager which is manager but by basic manager which is profit oriented. That that could be the danger, and maybe that's the, that's the base uh, the, 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 the 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 dilemma actually. But the cultural manager are not trained to uh, toward profit. So the, the cultural manager are, are trained to toward the, the, the public goods section. Yes, thank you. This is a really important message because by law, uh, museum directors are also responsible for collections. So this side, of course, is not acquired during the economic studies or similar. Danira, you have a, a reason the hand, yeah. yes. yes but uh, yes, thank you. Uh, on a short um, comment, like um, I just wanted to say that I'm economist, I'm not mm -hmm. creator, mm -hmm. and I'm director of the Creation Sports Museum, and uh, the knowledge that I have about how budget function, it helps me, but it wouldn't be enough if um, I don't, uh, if I'm um, not familiar with the area that I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. So, in my opinion, basically, it's like uh, the management skills and some economic knowledge uh, are really helpful, uh, being director, but also knowing uh, knowing the, the area that you're dealing with is really important because without um, both of these components, uh, I think it, um, it would be more difficult to have a vision, mission that we already talked about, and uh, you know, to have strategic ideas and uh, or ideas uh, how to to raise the visibility of your museum, etc. So, just that. Thank you. Yes, because being an uh, economist, you are also you were also a famous sportswoman of international career, so running a sports museum really makes you <laughs> linked uh, with the subject. Uh, now we are, uh, okay, Sanyin is leaving there, and one- I, I'm leaving, I just wanted to, 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 to mention that uh, I never, please don't quote me, I never said that academia is irrelevant. No. I mean, I'm much more inclined towards, you know, the, the idea is to have the best of both worlds. Yes, if you're just one make or the solution. other, it makes little sense. If yes. you can have a good grasp of what you're doing and you have a dedicated staff expert staff and then you're not just a manager but a leader who can really lead and inspire guy that's the key to success and having said that thank you for this i'm really sorry for leaving and uh, have a good rest of 
Thank you. Good luck. Nobody wants to uh, have an archaeologist for a director who goes away for a six months field work and doesn't appear in the museum for six months. <laughs> so let us let us finish.